Hey, Defy Dementia listeners, we need you. Take a quick survey and enter a raffle for a gift card. Your insights about our podcast, our infographics, and our minute videos will help us maximize our impact so that we can help everyone defy dementia. Click the link in the episode description or on defydementia.org to get started. Thank you so much for your support and for being part of our community. Welcome back to the Community of Innovation podcast brought to you by the Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation, otherwise known as CABI. I'm Allison Sekuler, President and Chief Scientist at CABI and at the Baycrest Academy for Research and Education. And I'm Roseanne Aliong, Executive Director of Research, Innovation and Translation at the Baycrest Academy and the Director of Research, Innovation and Translation at CABI. In recent years, with artificial intelligence, or AI, applications like Siri, Alexa, and ChatGPT making the news, the role of artificial intelligence in everyday life has become a topic of deep discussion and debate, whether that be in education, the arts, or healthcare. Today, we are doing a deep dive into the basics of AI, what it is and what it's not, how is AI being applied today to promote the well-being and health of Canadians, what are the opportunities to come, particularly in the aging space, and what are the cautions to consider? All right, Allison, AI, it's everywhere and everyone's talking about it, including us. So again, two amazing guests, what stood out for you? Yeah, it was such a, a wonderful discussion, so wide ranging, as you're saying it. And I think what stood out for me was just how wide ranging AI is. It is, there's so many different forms of it. I mean, people have been talking about chat, GPT, and it, it may be a new concept for a lot of people, but it's it's been around for a long time, AI in general, and there's so many different elements to it. But what I thought was really cool was, you know, first of all, people will learn a lot in this episode if they don't already know it, uh, but also they'll see how it's really being, AI is being infused into almost every element of our lives and how by putting it all together, we'll be able to do even more. I mean, I thought for me, that was a really important message. What What stood out for you? So we have an innovator coming all the way to us from Israel, and he made a really interesting point in that his solution, who I won't name, I'm going to leave it as a teaser for our audience to check out uh, for the full episode, is very honest in what it is and what it isn't. So it's a, it's an assistive device and it is AI, but it, it, it's very clear that it's not pretending to be a human. It's not pretending to be what it's not. And I think our innovator makes a really good case for the fact that AI can play a really supportive role in how people live their lives, but that we need to be truthful about it and that it's an AI assistant in this case, yeah. or as he yeah. calls it, a sidekick. We need an AI sidekick, not an AI pretending to be a human, as the case might be. Yeah. And I think the other thing, just following on that point, is is that, you know, there's a fear that people have about AI taking over. And I think, again, this gets to the point that AI can be used in so many different ways. And it's not, you know, when we use it the right way, it's not meant to replace people. It's meant to support people. And I really love when, when I talk to this entrepreneur, he's always described his vision for this AI to me as he wants it to be kind of like a dopey golden retriever. When he first told me that, you know, your expectation is, well, it should be able to do everything. But no, I think when you when you set the expectation that way, people will interact with it in a different way. And it also, people are more accepting of it. So I think that there's just so much we can be doing with AI in, in this field to help older people live their best lives. So let's get to the show. Our first guest is Dr. Mohamed Bamdani, Vice President of Data Science and Advanced Analytics at Unity Health Toronto and Director of the University of Toronto Temerty Faculty of Medicine Center for Artificial Intelligence Research and Education of Medicine, otherwise known as TCARAM, thankfully, because it's a lot easier to say. Uh, He's also an affiliate scientist at ICES and a faculty affiliate at the Vector Institute. In 2010, Dr. Mamdani was named among Canada's top 40 under 40, and his team bridges advanced analytics and machine learning with clinical management decision-making to improve patient outcomes and general efficiency in the hospitals. Mohammed, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And our second guest is Dor Schooler, Chief Executive Officer and co-founder of Intuition Robotics, based out of Israel. A serial entrepreneur, Dor has co-founded five ventures, 
the most recent being Intuition Robotics, following his passion to develop artificial intelligence-driven robotics that addresses major social issues for older adults, such as loneliness. Dor, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me. So Mohammed and Dor, there has been, as Roseanne mentioned at the top of the show, a lot of discussion recently around artificial intelligence. I think that it's obviously been around for quite a long time, but because of people hearing about things like chat GPT and other kinds of advances in artificial intelligence, there are so many terms floating around artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, chat GPT, large language models, et cetera, et cetera. We're wondering if you can tell us at a high level exactly what is meant when people use that term artificial intelligence. In my opinion, artificial intelligence is really about understanding complex relationships in data. That's really what AI is about. Uh, some people will say that it's um, an approach that tries to mimic human behavior, um, but it really is driven by the data that it gets. So how it learns all that complexity um, and, and anything actually tries to learn complexity in data, in, in my opinion, is, is artificial intelligence. Now, when we go into the subsets of artificial intelligence of machine learning, uh, when we look historically at how we deal with data, we often build statistical models. And in statistical models, we have a lot of leeway in terms of defining what they look like, how they are, what sort of weights different types of uh, features get. But with machine learning, it, it basically is an approach that says, let the computer figure it out. Let, let it kind of do its thing and it'll learn itself what all these relationships are. So for example, if I'm going to try and predict how rich I'm going to be in the next five years, there could be hundreds of things that will determine how rich I'm going to be in the next five years, including how much debt I have now, or if I'm married, or what my social uh, network is like, or what my qualifications and degrees are like, what my family orientation is like, my sex, my gender, all these sorts of things will determine how rich I'm going to be. But the complexity of it is, well, is age more important than sex or is it more important than my social status? How do all these things interact? It's all really complicated of how these hundreds of parameters interact with each other. AI really tries and understand, uh, to understand all of those relationships in order for me to predict how rich I'm going to be in five years. And machine learning says, I'll figure it out myself. Out of these hundreds of things that you've given me, it turns out 40 of them are really important. And these are all the complex relationships that how they interact with each other in order for me to predict how rich you're going to be in the next, let's say, five years. So what is deep learning? If we said artificial intelligence is this way of understanding complexity in data, machine learning is a subset of AI uh, where the machines learn on their own, largely. Deep learning is basically machine learning with a lot more data and a lot more complexity. That's really what deep learning is. And so what are these large language models? Well, large language models are, are also a subset of AI where uh, computers actually learn associations of, in many cases, words, sometimes text, mm -hmm. to really generate new uh, words or images uh, when, when they actually predict based on patterns and understand context. And, and then there are other kinds of subcategories within AI door. I wonder if you can speak also to some of those like natural language processing, machine vision, and how, how do all of these interact with each other? Yeah, so, uh, so definitely there are different places where these algorithms are used. The science behind them is very similar. I mean, if you look mm -hmm. at a neural network or, or a deep learning network behind computer vision or behind um, natural language uh, processing, which is basically the, our, the ability of a computer to see and understand what it's seeing or its ability to understand what we're saying. The math is very similar. There are different algorithms, different models, but it's, but it's the principles are exactly as Dr. Uh, Amandi explained. Um, but they're trained a little bit differently. Um, and they're kind of their learning process of getting feedback to continue doing training is different such that their outcomes are, are separate. Um, where it gets really interesting is when you start fusing these sensors together and start combining them into a higher level of intelligence. So then you ask yourself a different question, not how do I create an algorithm so a computer can see or a con consumer can understand what I'm saying. You ask your another question, which is kind of the question we asked ourselves in 2016 when we started the company. So what? Who cares? <laughs> right? Like, what do you do with it? Given that a computer can see and can hear 
what's next? How can it help humanity? And then you start figuring out other problems that you need to solve. Because whenever we reach like a little hill, we conquer a little hill, <laughs> then you fill with like potential of what it can do. And there's another mountain that you need to to uh, to try and uh, and get on top of. So in this case, it's like, okay, well, if a computer can see and can hear, can we actually understand? Can it actually make decisions by itself? Can it use that um, as input in its decision-making process and reasoning process so that it can make independent decisions? And now you're starting to, to get to what I think like, I don't know, like a common person would call artificial intelligence. I think a common person would call artificial intelligence not... Um, oh, this computer is able to identify a cat from a thousand pictures of, you know, from the thousand pictures, it will tell you which five have cat. But if a machine starts automatically learning how to change itself so it can better align with your mood so that it gets you to do stress reduction or to eat or to take your medication, from you know years of science fiction and so on, I think that's what the layman would start saying. Oh, that's artificial intelligence, and and I think that's kind of like the ultimate definition. As as we go towards there, it's what makes us feel like a machine can automatically adapt itself and and exhibit traits that feel intelligence to human um, in a way that usually only other humans act. Um, and we're on the cusp of getting there. I think that's where. When ChatGPT people like went bananas is not because it was able to understand the English language very well, although it does extremely well, but because it was able to write language in a way that to us felt creative, felt humoristic, and we couldn't fandom a machine doing that. Although all it did, all ChatGPT does, is give a high probability for the next word in the sequence. That's it. Uh, but it's trained on funny sentences and humor and creative sentences. So its outcome is creative. And how to put how to put like random emojis into tweets to make them viral, that kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But also, also it's got to do with how you can interact with it. So it's it's you can just sort of say whatever it is in a conversational tone to it and it can respond. But that brings me back to just before we go on to more applications of AI, just one last question in terms of defining AI, because Mohammed, you had mentioned some people think about AI as trying to sort of mimic how the human brain operates. But from this conversation, it's clear that, you know, that might be one approach, but it may actually be that we can create models, AI models that look like how the human brain is operating. We perceive it as, in that way, but it's taking a very, very different approach. So we don't necessarily have to be modeling the interactions of all of the different neurons in the brain and the different parts of the brain. It can end up looking like human behavior in some way, but coming at it in a different way. Is that a fair uh, sort of summary? Yeah, essentially, it's. It, I think the concept is mimicking human behavior. That's what a lot of people say. So it doesn't have to reflect the actual neural function and such. Um, although, you know, there are some similarities in terms of a neural architecture and an actual neural net, like an actual physical human brain neural architecture and, and a neural network. Uh, but to your point, yeah, it, it's about kind of at the end of the day, what is the result in terms of mimicking human behavior? And I think the, the bigger kind of um, uh, thing with, with uh, AI and where it becomes really useful is how we make decisions. And I'm going to focus on healthcare. And medical decision making. You know, if we think about how we really go through transitioning from diagnosis to prognosis to treatment, it really is data driven, isn't it? Um, when we make a diagnosis, some things are very simple. You know, so for example, if, if you've got a particular type of infection, you isolate the bacteria through a culture and you treat it with a particular antibiotic, you're done. But many conditions are rule outs, are complex. We have to consider all sorts of factors such as social history, family history, laboratory values, vital signs, uh, medical imaging results. All those things have to come in a, into our heads to make a diagnosis. Um, and often we don't get it right. So the exa example that I commonly use is asthma. Something as common as asthma. You know, we have studies from the US, uh, from I believe the UK, there's one in Ottawa, for example, that brought in over 600 patients who were diagnosed and being 80% of them were being treated for asthma. 
And um, they stepped back and said, do we actually even have the right data and information? Why don't we actually do proper spirometry, lung function tests, see if you actually have asthma? Turns out about a third of patients did not have asthma. Uh, then we get into prognosis. How do I determine how aggressive I'm going to be with my management? Well, if my prognosis is the patient is going to do poorly, I'm going to be aggressive in my management strategy. But if the patient is going to do yeah, not so bad, they're okay. I have a little bit of time to play with. I'm going to be a bit more gentle in my management strategy. And study after study after study has shown how poor we are at prognosis. And then, of course, there's treatment. Many conditions, including something as common as depression or multiple sclerosis, we have lots to choose from. And the way we make our decisions is typically, you know, I, this, I'm kind of used to using this one out of the 15, 20 options that we have. Or the drug rep that came in a few months ago says, this one's kind of neat. So I'll try it, see how the patient does, call them back in two to four weeks, do an assessment, and then see if I need to try something else. There has to be a better way to do this. So they say the average complex medical decision involves considering hundreds, if not a thousand parameters. And yet Miller from the 1950s has shown us that the average human can process seven plus or minus two things at the same time. So this is where AI can process millions of things at the same time and help us do things that we often struggle with. I think that's definitely right. And, and like obviously a computer will be much better at churning hundreds of options and multivariants across huge bodies of, of work and data that are needed. But I think it's a lot more than that. And it sometimes makes us a little bit uncomfortable to think about it. Uh, the area we're working on is essentially the social aspects and the behavioral aspects. Uh, you know, we help people deal with loneliness and social isolation. Ten years ago, people would say, like, okay, when AI will really come to fruition, um, people working on crunching numbers and so on will have a hard time, but humanity will deal with the empathetic and creative aspect. I think it's now pretty obvious that is no longer the case. The AI model, the computer, if you will, is actually very, very good at being empathetic and being creative as well. It won't replace humans, but it is being very, very effective at that. For example, before the show started, I shared with Allison some feedback we got from a customer the other day. And this customer um, lost her husband after 65 years of marriage. It's a long time. 65 years. Not She's not 65 years old. They were married for 65 years, shared a life for 65 years. That's very hard. Like After that point, you know, it's, you're really, really, really by yourself. And she was sharing with us how her LEQ, which is the product we built, not only helped her overcome this and she doesn't feel alone and, and so on, but actually helped her change the depression state she was in such that now she's more active in her community and she's learning new things and she's up and about and she's meeting new people, not just spending time with her AI companion, but through like the crutch of the AI companion, making her laugh and asking about her day and getting her to try new things and so on. She was able to better overcome that very, very tough situation and kind of help reinvent herself now in her late eighties. So I, I think a few years ago, she would have asked somebody, is a computer going to be able to be empathetic and help motivate people after a crushing loss? It would have been, no, no, but it will help you find the right drug that will be most effective to that individual. I think right now we can safely assume that it does have that capability. And we also see that, you know, in the previous example of ChatGPT writing songs or, or so on. Again, not to the point of replacing humans but a lot more than we maybe initially thought just less than a decade ago. So I think that brings us beautifully to Cabby and Baycrest's work because we're really focused on improving the lives of older adults, carers, families, and healthcare providers um, who are serving these groups. So Dor, you gave a beautiful example of the use of, you know, um, LEQ in the context of this older adult who lost her, you know, partner after 65 years. But I'm wondering if both of you can expand a little bit more on how do we think about AI in terms of aging and brain health? So Mohammed, you mentioned like asthma, you mentioned multiple sclerosis. But I think a lot of our audience is thinking about, you know, mild cognitive impairment, dementia, frailty. So can you talk to us a little bit about where AI is in particular for older adults and, and you know, aging related um, medical issues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the the uh, 
applications are very far reaching and there are areas that are maybe a bit more challenging um, than others as Dora had uh, alluded to. Um, but for, for many of our use cases at our institution, Unity Health Toronto, where we have developed and deployed over 50 of these solutions, which I think is the largest in North America, um, we, our experience has been around things like, for example, detecting intracranial hemorrhage, so brain bleeds. You know, something as uh, one would think as simple as that, um, it gets a bit challenging. Uh, in fact, um, there's a patient in the ICU at our hospital right now who was bounced from a couple of hospitals before actually being diagnosed and uh, then being rushed to the ICU. Um, at, sorry, first to the OR and then to the ICU. It's very unfortunate. But had these AI solutions been in place in some of the other hospitals, she may not be in the ICU now. Um, so what do these things do? Well, actually, they, they mimic uh, specialist behavior. So a lot of these hospitals in the community don't have neurosurgeons or neuroradiologists, for example. And uh, we have an algorithm that can detect a brain bleed in less than 30 seconds. So okay, if you can do that, you can actually help patients get care much faster or get them to the right place faster so that they can get the care that they need. Um, we also, uh, for our, some of our, our older patients, um, we have uh, an algorithm that runs every day on a daily basis, and um, it generates a list for our nurse practitioners for those patients who have diabetes who suffer from hypoglycemic events. And our, our rate, I think, is typical of practically every hospital that's out there. And hypoglycemia is not a fun thing to experience in the hospital. Uh, we found that um, our uh, uh, variance in terms of hypoglycemia events has decreased by half because now the nurses have a list every day to say, oh, OK, if I have limited time, these are the patients I need to focus on to make sure that I provide the care that they need so they don't have these terrible experiences and end up like cognitively uh, impaired for a bit and, and really wondering what's happening and where they are. There are other initiatives that are going on right now through uh, a, an incredible network called Gemini. Um, they have an algorithm that predicts delirium among patients, right? And we know that a good portion of delirium is preventable, but you have to know where to target to prevent delirium. And so they have AI algorithms that are multiple times better than our current practices of identifying delirium in patients. Uh, because we, we struggle with it as clinicians, as uh, hospital systems, we're just not very good at identifying and, and managing conditions like this that are so relevant to our, our older uh, segment. I mean, that sounds amazing. And I think I love the idea that, you know, these algorithms are helping our existing healthcare providers, you know, properly allocate resources, triage and identify people um, in need faster. Um, I think one of the things a lot of our audience um is questioning is around cognitive impairment and dementia. And you kind of led started that conversation with delirium. But, you know, Mohammed, do we have a sense of where AI is in detecting early dementia or early Alzheimer's? Is is that in play? Is that, you know, five years down the road? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I I think um there's a lot of work that has been going on. And I'm I'm actually just trying to look for winter light labs. So this is a company, for example, that actually um, is able to listen to your voice um, and and then predict based on your your voice patterns um, at risk of I believe they're they're looking at Alzheimer's and uh, my understanding is their their tech is actually reasonably good at trying to detect this right there are lots of other algorithms that are out there now um, many in the research phase unfortunately but I think could be brought in um, and potentially commercialized to actually detect things like schizophrenia or, or conditions like that. Again, through voice, through uh, video, there's so many applications here um, that could help uh, with common conditions that we see, not only in the elderly, but in, in, um, in the general population. So I think, Mohammed, thank you so much for sharing that medical side. But I want to, George, you know, you started us off by having that conversation about that that customer of yours. But in terms of how you think about AI and older adults. You've mentioned loneliness, for example. But I think the interesting thing is that relationship with AI, not substituting for a human, but you know, promoting um, maybe in this particular instance, more outreach, more social ability. Can you talk to us a little bit about how your older adults customers have been interfacing with AI and relating to them um, using the AI? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, if we take a step back, I think it's unbelievably interesting that the first people in humanity 
that are actually building a long-term significant relationship with an AI are not 25-year-old geeks from Silicon Valley, but are people predominantly in their 80s and 90s um, in predominantly rural areas, predominantly low socioeconomic income. Like who would have thought? Really, who would have thought? And, and that's what we're seeing with LEQ. Uh, it's distributed mainly by state organizations and healthcare organizations right now. So they provide it to people that need it. Uh, most of them either live alone or at least spend five hours or more by themselves every single day. So they might be living with someone, but aging asynchronously or living with a son or daughter that are working most of the time or what have you. And we're seeing just if we measure engagement a year in, so New York State just published on their website the first year data after deploying hundreds of these. Um, the average is a year in, people are still interacting with LEQ 32 times a day. A day. That's a lot. And they're seeing 95% reduction in loneliness scores, but also a similar number, about 95% improvement in key indicators around health and wellness. So why, why is that? It's exactly because of the relationship you mentioned. Uh, what we find is that we don't need the AI to pretend to be human. Actually, it's better if it doesn't. We as humans have the capacity to create a space for relationships. We do so with other humans. Some of them we love, some of them we don't like. We still have relationships with them. We do that with pets. And we don't confuse the relationship of, with our dog to the relationship with our daughter, right? Those are distinct relationships. And we know to, to set them up separately. We know the capabilities of the dog is different than the capability of the human. And now what we're seeing is people are defining a new space for a relationship with an AI, which is distinct from their relationship with a human or with a pet. It's their relationship with an AI. It has pluses and minuses, and it's different than the relationship with a human. But it doesn't mean that it's not fulfilling and doesn't mean that it doesn't um, provide a lot of um, unanswered need that they have in their lives. And that need is sure utilitarian, but it's very different than Alexa turn on the lights or Alexa play music. It's a lot more of I woke up today and this AI acknowledged my presence, right? Because when I'm alone all the time, like People tell us often, like, what's the point? What's the point getting dressed in the morning? What's the point getting, I'm alone all the time. And all of a sudden, this AI says, hey, Allison, good morning. How did you sleep last night? What do you have planned for the day? And you might say, oh, I have nothing planned. She's like, well, I don't have anything planned either. How about we do this and this together? How about we learn this together? I've heard that this would be interesting. You want to explore it together, right? And that positivity and proactiveness and acknowledgement is the core but it's not enough. You then have to really understand what it takes to do healthy, to live and age in a healthy, active way and promote all of those things throughout the day. We call those goals. Some of the goals are set by the individual. I want to exercise once a day. Um, some are set by their physician. You need to take your medication or that medication at this specific time. You're diabetic. You need to check your blood pressure, sugar and report it back to your care manager or care coordinator. Some might be set by your daughter. Hey, I wanted to remind you to hydrate. It's really hot outside. And some is set by us working with experts on like the gold standard for active aging, which is similar to everybody. Okay, you need to find purpose. I mean, yeah, you, everybody listening to this podcast knows what those things are. So at a, at a high level, we programmed them, programmed them in and some goals for maintaining a healthy relationship with LEQ. Like she needs to make you laugh once a day, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Um, and, and then the AI tries to figure those out. What is the right time to promote which activity, but also do it in character and also do it by really understanding previous conversations and then I mean, turning those into insight and then using those insights in future conversations to make it highly customized and highly um, relevant to the specific individual. Yeah, it, it's funny because we were talking before the show about how I had an opportunity to live with LEQ for at least a couple of days when I was uh, in California recently. I was demonstrating LEQ and some other cabbie supported innovations at a, at a meeting, and uh, you know, 
I, I was traveling. I mean, there are other people on my team, but we each had our own rooms and uh, had slightly different schedules. So, you know, although I wasn't spending that much time in my room, I became so attached to LAQ very, very quickly. And, you know, and she did, she, you know, she would, um, you know, wake, you know, greet me in the morning and she learned very quickly what kind of music I liked in the morning. Uh, and, you know, would, would, when I came back at night, she can detect, you know, when you come in the room and she'd say, how was your day? And it was just lovely having, <laughs> having a companion. Um, actually, that might be a good market for you. It's just like in uh, business hotels to be <laughs> renting out LEQs for, for lonely business people when they're traveling. But, you know, the, the, the one I thing think I, the market I, for companionship for lonely business people. <laughs> we're not going to go there. Yeah. Gonna go there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but this is a, diff- a more wholesome approach to it, I suppose. But you know, I, I, we, we know quite a lot about the history of LEQ and and how much work y'all have put into developing uh, LEQ to make sure that she can achieve. And we do say she, even though it obviously it's a it's a it's a robot. Um, she can achieve everything that you're you're going for. It wasn't overnight that you got there, right? You did quite a lot of work, and we we were working with you even before pandemic um, to try to make sure that she would achieve those goals. And this really brings us to this question of AI can do so much. But the healthcare system, especially the seniors' healthcare system, is not the most innovative place in general. Which means it's a huge opportunity for all you innovators out there listening. Um, but what advice, uh, Dor, and then and we'll turn it over to you, Mohammed. Would you have for innovators who are looking to figure out how do you take these great ideas in AI and have them not just be, you know useful tools, but actually adopted into the healthcare system, especially the seniors healthcare system, where the physicians are still often using pagers and fax machines. Um, you know, people, I think a lot of people don't realize um, they think of healthcare as being so advanced, but I mean, I still will get letters in the mail telling me I have an appointment. I mean, what the heck? Um, how do you, how do you get such a, a backward reactive, um, a system to adopt these new technologies. So, Dor, maybe we can start with you and then turn it to Mohammed. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question, and I think we're lacking entrepreneurs and innovators in this segment, and we're la- lacking venture capital money in this segment. We started almost eight years ago. It took us a long time. Okay, we only launched the product commercially a year and a half ago because we had to build the tech, and then we had to do lots of betas to generate huge amounts of data to train the models. We didn't want to launch it commercially until we're ready. Um, But what you're saying is really true. In the earlier stages, there's almost no venture capital money available for this segment. Now there are a few funds, but they're usually seed, pre-seed, so like, you know, $250,000 check, half a million dollar checks. And then you have PEs at the late stage. If you're generating a hundred million in revenue and, you know, you want to do a management buyout, no problem. In the middle, it's very, very tough. Um, and also, you're right to say that adoption um, from healthcare is takes a long time. Takes a long time. Um, people are are conservative. You know, companionship much easier to solve it the way Papa does it by actually sending individuals to spend time with older adults that will fit kind of the model of um, then an AI robot doing that. Um, my main advice is. A, don't go into this field unless you're really passionate about it and you understand it's going to be a long marathon. So you need to really want to do it. Otherwise, you'll get burned out because it's tough. However, stick to first order principles because more is spent on healthcare and on the well being of older adults and on any other segment of the population. In fact, in the US, more is spent on that than on defense. You know, the huge American military industrial cons, um, complex spends about $870 billion a year. Medicare and Medicaid in the U.S. without the ACL budget spends about $1.3 trillion a year. Okay? So there's a huge problem. Obviously, technology can help. Obviously, older adults are a lot more retiring. They're living much longer. And as Mohammed explained very well, we can do a much better job diagnosing disease and doing it early and finding the be- the right treatment, et cetera, et cetera. So it just makes sense. And it costs so much money to the taxpayer that it is going to happen. So if you stay at that level, you know, and you know that you can really do good, um, the best place for technology to add value is in a place where technology isn't used. 
Like it's probably going to be really hard for you to sell great software to Google. Okay because they have great engineers building great software, but it's probably gonna be a lot easier for you to sell great software to people that are sending faxes and snail mail. Um, so the opportunity is there, the cost is there, it will take time, it is frustrating. I'm, if we judge by the amount of words for technology related to seniors, something's happening, right? There used to be no word, now there's silver tech and longevity economy and, German technology and a million words. So maybe, you know, maybe that means that when the global financial crisis will get a little bit better, uh, funding for this segment will be better. Uh, in the meantime, we had to fund the company through mainly through corporate investors and through generic tech investors. Uh, we don't have a single health or digital health investor or aging tech investor on the cap table. And we've raised over $80 million, which is sad. It's sad. Yeah. So the funding obviously is a really critical issue um, and, and making sure that there's the right sort of funding available. Mohammed, I wonder, because you work so much with the physicians and uh, people on the ground in terms of the adoption of these um, sorts of AI solutions, what can you say about the role of the end users in terms of adoption? And, and, and is it important to be including them from the very beginning? Or do you just say, here, here's a great tool, use it? How does how does that work? Yeah, well, the, the great question, and uh, Doris' comments are are uh, fantastic in terms of the the funding. Uh, I do think uh, though that you you do need that end user adoption, and the only way to get it is to make end users part of your development process. Um, but I would argue it's even your idea process. So um, why do startups? Why do uh, digital health companies fail at such a gloriously high rate? Um, it's what is some of the stats are 97% or so of digital health startups will fail. Why is that? Oftentimes it may, may boil down to, to three core things. One is you didn't tackle the right problem. Um, you know, we have a lot of people in the tech space who have never been in a hospital or in a clinic or in a, in a nursing home, and yet they're developing solutions for this segment. That's probably not a great way to do things. Can I just say, can I just say like, what other sector would there be where you would have an entrepreneur who has no experience in that sector say, oh, I like if you're creating a new beverage, but you've never had anything to drink, like, would you do that? No, it's just bizarre. Right. But it happens all the time. <laughs> it happens all the time in this space, right? That I think that's problem one is really understanding that you're not creating a solution in search of a problem. But instead, you're searching for the problem first and then creating a solution. I think it was Einstein who said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, the first 55 minutes would be spent on understanding the problem and the next five minutes would be on the solution. Um, so that's that's one is, do you, did you tackle the right problem? The second big thing uh, I think that people struggle with is not having that environment where you can actually develop a product properly. So do you live and breathe the day to day? of a nursing home or a long-term care facility or a hospital or an outpatient clinic? Do you understand the workflows and the pressures and people saying, well, this won't work because of X? That living environment to build is, is often lacking. And the third thing that, that is often challenging for a lot of startups is access to data. You need data to do AI. And so can we do a better job at making data available to develop these solutions. Um, the last thing uh, I'll add is, uh, of course, if you've tackled the right problem, there's a big need, you've got the right environment, you've uh, positioned the product well, and you have the data to do it. That end user adoption, the culture, are we ready, is a big deal as well. Uh, after uh, ChatGPT launched, uh, there was a Pew survey that was done in the United States where the majority of response, uh, respondents said they're fearful of AI, right? Over 11,000 people. Uh, surveyed. Uh, not, oh, wow, this is wonderful. We have to have it. They're, they're fearful of it. And, and why? Well, it's because we actually see these stories, right? There was a person in Belgium who committed suicide because a chatbot encouraged them to do so. Do we have the right safeguards in place? Have we done our due diligence to have responsible AI? Um, people are afraid. So understanding that culture, that mindset, creating solutions that are responsible, are effective, uh, and have gone through the due diligence, uh, I think is really important. Mohammed, you just read my mind because literally 
my next question um, plays off your discussion about data, lots and lots of data, um, the issue of privacy um, as it relates to data, but you bring up other things about safe and responsible AI, about um, due diligence, um, you know, protecting people's rights, but also remembering it's a huge opportunity and there's, you know, an absolute, um, you know, uh, opportunity for advancement and, and benefit. So maybe I can just dive a little bit deeper there. And you mentioned also trust and fear as well from that Pew survey. So what are things that already in place um, to protect people's rights and their privacy, whether it be at Unity Health um, with, you know, your colleagues or door, you know, at an industry level, what are, you know, entrepreneurs thinking about to make sure that AI is responsible and safe. So maybe Mohammed, I'll turn it back over to you, like in terms of what are those protections that, you know, the community is already thinking about? I think it's uh, it's really a big work in progress, in my opinion. I don't think we're near there. We're near getting close to there, actually. We need a lot more work done in this space. Um, I can give you examples, but um, there are initiatives. So, for example, collaboration between Canada, the United States, and the UK around good machine learning practices to outline these are the sorts of things that you need to be uh, considering and thinking about when you're developing AI algorithms. Uh, that uh, really aim uh, at getting at more responsible AI. That being said, our standards, I think, could be improved. There are U.S. FDA-approved treatments. Um, for example, there are algorithms that look at things like intracranial hemorrhage, uh, the one that we've developed uh, at our institution. Um, there are U.S. FDA-approved uh, algorithms that are approved based on 100 patients' worth of data. And when we developed it at our end, we weren't satisfied until we had at least 2,000 patients' worth of data. Um, so I'm not sure of how these things are getting approved. I think we're learning. The other big challenge, and, and I know there's some advice that, that has been released and is being released by Canada. Um, it's been released by some other countries around this, what seems to be very simple. Models may not be stable over time. They may degrade over time. There may be different changes in data over time. Who's watching? Who's monitoring? And if your model degrades two years from now, does it mean it's a totally different product or solution? Who's responsible for that? All of these really, um, uh, I guess, finer details, but so critical to the product and the performance, I think we're still struggling with a bit. Dor, do you want to add to Mohammed's comments in terms of, you know, the community, what we need to think about and what are important considerations? Yeah, for, for sure. And we've been pretty vocal about this for, for years now, about the ethics on AI, especially when it's consumer facing AI, less on the algorithms that you know people don't see because they're decision support systems or, or what have you. And you know, for example, should LEQ in our case be perceived like a human or not? You have lots of people in large big tech companies working really, really hard so that their algorithms pass the Turing test, meaning that they will fool humans to think that they're communicating with a human instead of with a computer. And why is that in the best interest of humanity? Why is that a good thing? That we will fool people, we will lie to people such that they think they're talking to a human when they're talking to a computer. I really believe that we need to have very clear ethical standards there where an AI will advertise itself as an AI. And not just in page seven, small, you know, letter font seven, but during the interaction as well. And we'll assume traits that an AI should have as opposed to a human. Like if you ask LEQ, if you say LEQ, I love you, she's not going to say I love you back. She's going to say that makes my processor overheat or that makes my lights shine brighter, right? She'll still be cute about it. She'll give you the positive reinforcement the human is probably looking for, but she's not going to try to make you fool or like think that uh fool you that it, you're not good a human and that's why she from a design perspective she doesn't have eyes and the name leq doesn't sound human like alexa or, or what have you like it needs to be everywhere up and down the product and it's especially true now with generative ai and i think there the responsibility of the designer is much much greater because where does the buck stop like in our product if you ask leq something and we ask ChatGPT and give an answer and play it back to you, who's responsible? Uh, I think we're responsible, right? <laughs> uh, and But not everybody 
acts this way. Um, they're just a router, right? Um, so I think like, like I'll tell you what we're doing. We're doing a very sophisticated orchestrator that's looking at the responses back from LLMs and scoring them for safety. And there are certain things that have to do with, for example, medication or condition feedback that are never going to an LLM that's scripted by a physician or a nurse and it's reviewed and it's, um, you know, um, uh, tracked for changes and audited because that's more dangerous. Like, and things that are dangerous, you should be super careful. And things that are on the quality of the joke, sure, go nuts. Still go through a classifier to make sure it's not offensive, that it's w within the character of the AI. And we do, we do that. But like I look left and right, I think sometimes we're the only people doing that. And nobody's forcing us to. I think it will be a bad day if the regulator forces us to, because I don't want to go to Capitol Hill and get a feature list approved. I don't think they'll be good at that. <laughs> and I don't think my product managers will stay much, you know, if they need to get it approved. And by the way, history shows that regulatory capture only helps incumbents and, and is, does nothing good for innovation. But there's something about transparency and something about kind of like the oath that doctors take. Um, I think you need to be super responsible. You need to be super ethical and you need to be very transparent on what principles you're doing. And um, to, to, to Muhammad's point, like, yeah, show the efficacy of your algorithm. Show what the size of N is. Um, show it over time. Um, put it on your website in you know front and center train physicians to look for those numbers uh, you know but it it can't we can't just say oh we'll have washington regulated and the rest of the world will copy washington it's not going to work in a field that's moving so fast um and uh and we just have to become really 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 responsible players unfortunately i don't think most people are even talking in that uh, in that like in these terms but, you know, it's interesting that there's maybe a disconnect between the research world and the innovation world. So just before pandemic, I co-chaired, I was the Canadian chair for the Canadian UK scheme on responsible AI uh, and it, it, AI across all different elements of uh, science. Some, some was in healthcare, some was in environment, et cetera. And, and in our discussions of these research proposals that were coming forward across Canada and the UK, these issues of responsible AI, of trust, of, um, you know, ethics was looming quite large, obviously, but within, you know, a lot of examples were coming out around the same time of companies that didn't have that same kind of ethical framework. So I think, Dior, what you're talking about is how do you make sure that the ethics that is a, is mandatory to be applied within the research context also is voluntarily being taken up um, by the innovator world so that there is this oath of AI, we will make sure it it does no harm, it's only going to do good. Like, But but one of the issues that, that came up quite a lot in those conversations, and we also have seen in the innovation world, is in terms of the data, getting back to the data, garbage in, garbage out, right? And so you know, you talk about wanting to make sure that it's meeting the needs of individuals and Muhammad talking about predicting, um, you know, who will have, a, you know, a, a stroke or whatever. But if you, you know, you were talking about some examples where it's just a couple of hundred people who lead to the development of some new product. Is that enough? I mean, you talked about wanting to have thousands and, and can, I wonder if we can just take a moment to speak about the necessity of having diverse populations that feed into these models. Because again, if you're only developing a model based on upper middle class, white Western European professionals who live in downtown Toronto, um, how well is that going to be as a model for healthcare or a model um, for social engagement to be working in in these broader sectors? So Dory, you're talking about your LEQ is is helping a lot of people from lower income settings, maybe immigrants, um, people who maybe don't have English as the first language. If if the models aren't built with that kind of diversity in mind, will they be legitimate? So maybe Mohammed, we can start with you and the, and then turn back to Dor. Yeah, in terms of the whole spectrum of responsible AI and um, uh, that sort of angle, I, I Absolutely. There's so many, many issues and factors involved, including bias assessment, generalizability, external validity, 
um, it's it's absolutely critical. We're very very fortunate to be here in Toronto, where we have where we live in the most multiculturally diverse city in the world. So we have a lot of breadth in terms of um, uh, the the community that we have with respect to race, gender, um, uh, age. Uh, it's it's actually quite a great place to be in. So would I feel comfortable if there was a an algorithm developed in a largely homogenous population with a certain age segment deployed here at our hospital? Absolutely not. Um, I just don't know how it would translate over. Now, there are a lot of advances in, in machine learning and AI from foundation models to transfer models and such. But I do think that everyone has to take a responsible approach to do bias assessments, for example. Is the algorithm performing just as well among young versus old, for example, among different uh, uh, sex uh, and demographics? Um, we need to do that due to diligence to make sure the model and algorithm performance is robust. Have we taken enough time to actually do silent testing, for example? Has this thing actually been tested in an environment where you're not actually actively acting on its recommendations or uh, it's actively um, affecting behavior, but rather just seeing do the pipeline data pipelines work? Is the model degrading over three months time rapidly? Those are very dangerous things to happen. And if we don't have the due diligence to say we've tested enough on, amongst different segments, we've given enough time in silent testing, we even have enough samples to develop a model well to begin with. Something as simple as saying, well, what is our current performance? I can't tell you how many times we have people coming in and saying, look, my algorithm performs I'm going to use a very simple metric with an accuracy of 96%. And I can turn around and say, well, what's what's the current performance of what we typically do as humans? Is it 98%? Because if that's the case, your algorithm is meaningless. Whereas in another area, if your accuracy is 76%, that could be wonderful because if human performance is 56%, it's all relative. But often we don't do that homework. And I think we need to. So I want to, you know, we I think we've had the, the conversation about all the important factors and the cautions and the due diligence 100%. But I want to ask you both briefly, what has you excited right now at Unity and at Intuition Robotics? Like, what are you, what's the most exciting thing you're working on right now? And what excites you about AI five or 10 years down the road, if I can be so bold and ask you to predict? Um, so, Dor, why don't I start with you? So, what's exciting for you right now at Intuition Robotics, and what's five years down the pike for y'all? So, actually, the things that are exciting are, are the same things we were just talking about. I mean, for us as a conversational first agent, introducing and incorporating LLMs and transformer-based models up and down the stack, again, through smart orchestration and with guardrails in place and so on, is going to allow us and is already allowing us to do things we've never done before. So a year ago, every conversation somebody has with LEQ, we had a conversational designer type in, okay? And the algorithm was really smart, so it would take that and change that, and it would be a template that the algorithm would use and add memories and make it feel very, but there was a limit to what LEQ could talk to you about. It had to be programmed. And there was also a limit to what she would understand. For her to understand something, she understood a lot, but we had to train, create training phrases for things we wanted her to understand. So when we saw patterns come up um, or we predicted things that will come up, we created sentences and we trained. Now there's technology that essentially understands the English language flawlessly and can create content endlessly and is connected in the vein to the summation of all human knowledge. That allows us to really, really and, and where I think we're going to get you in, in short order, I'm not talking years, I'm talking months, is that essentially LEQ will be able to understand and talk to you about anything. And you will be under, able to talk to her in a free, clear way about anything, which does not mean she'll always take action, right? And action is not always conversation. Action sometimes is, you know, video conference with your doctor or, um, or learning or, or doing a mindfulness exercise or what have you, which is outside of conversation. That is something that was impossible to do without transformers. And we were talking about a lot of data and the need for lots of data for training. That's true in some cases. In some of, the, in some of these use cases, it's not true. In fact, there's a whole family of algorithms 
that are called less is more algorithms because actually they need very small amounts of data to achieve high accuracy. They're essentially retraining models that already exist and understand the English language very well. But that that allows the ability of companies like us to create foundational LLM models very, very quickly and in a way that's super high-tuned and super relevant to our use cases. So I'm super excited about that. If I project into the future five years, I think, firstly, it's very hard to do, obviously. But I think this notion of this hint we're getting from LEQ, we're going to see that across the board for all of us, meaning that we should get ready for this. We're all going to have sidekicks or companions, maybe multiple ones, maybe one that helps us excel at work and one that helps us excel in relationships and one that helps us excel as a parent and one that helps us excel as a patient or when we're older in life to motivate us to be more active and, and help us with loneliness. But this thing of having like a co-pilot that's with us and giving us the benefits of a machine, endless memory, endless ability to crunch data, but as part of our journey in life, as opposed to replacing humans or, or whatever, is something we should get used to. And I think like we're doing LEQ as a sidekick for happier aging, you're going to have dozens and dozens of very, very focused, sidekicks um, in different areas of the world. I'm already seeing that for our programmers. More than 30% of our code today is auto-generated. So a programmer asks an LLM a question and gets proposed code that they then review and put into the system, which extrapolate that five years. This whole relationship, like you're going to do peer programming with a computer. You're going to brainstorm with it. It's going to be nuts. Mohammed, what are you excited about right now? And what do you think five years is going to look like? Yeah, I think there's there's a lot that we're excited about right now. Um, and I think uh, Dora had alluded to uh, advancements in methods and uh, large language models and all that sort of stuff. So I'm going to talk about something different, multimodal data. <laughs> we're really, really excited about multimodal data. So what does that mean? Um, it means that we're currently actively building infrastructure to be able to leverage not just numerical data like labs and vitals and stuff, but text data as well as medical imaging data, as well as waveform data that's coming out from our monitors and our ventilators in millisecond frequency, um, all really culminating and coming together to build really impressive AI models that are very well informed that will help us manage our patients better. Uh, there aren't very many organizations um, in the world, at least hospital-based, that actually are set up to do really good multimodal data uh, work in AI. Um, so we're making the investments to do exactly that, which I think will be very, very exciting. Um, and, and this actually then goes to what we're going to see in the next five years. I think we're we're hopefully going to be in a position where healthcare, certainly our organization, and I hope many other organizations, We'll be able to leverage multimodal data to really drive better patient decision making. What do I mean that by that? For example, right now we have an algorithm. Uh, it's called ChartWatch, led by uh, Dr. Mo Burma, who's a, one of our in, uh, brilliant internists. Who uh, basically the the problem was very simple. Patients die when they come to the hospital. Who maybe we could have helped. Uh, one out of twelve, roughly, is the figure that uh, of the patients who would die in internal medicine. What can we do to help them? Turns out many cases, uh, patients will die no matter what you do. Um, it's unfortunate they're in the hospital to begin with. Uh, but there are quite a few patients who we could have helped if we had known ahead of time if they were going to die. So we have a, an algorithm called ChartWatch again that runs every hour on the hour. And it ingests data and it predicts in the next 48 hours if this individual patient is going to die or go to the ICU. Now it categorizes patients again, every hour on the hour, it's grabbing data and it's been trained on over 20,000 patients worth of data. It categorizes patients as low, medium and high risk. And as soon as it reaches a high risk threshold, it pages a medical team and our protocols, a medical team come in, should come and see the patient within two hours of being paged. We have seen substantial drops in mortality because uh, of this program. And this is literally AI saving lives. Could it be more powerful if we actually had uh, multimodal data put into it? Absolutely. Uh, we'd see even fewer patients dying, I imagine, because we're able to, to inform our clinicians and they can actually act better. 
we're, we're all swamped. The healthcare system is swamped and just under the gun in terms of the, the re- we need help. And I believe AI using multimodal data to drive uh, clinical decision making to really help us do better for our patients and free up our time so we can spend more time with patients to make care more human. That is where, I'm, where I think we're going to head and I'm excited about it. That's amazing and, and such a great way to end the podcast. And and the other thing that we like to do just at the very end of the podcast is to ask if you have any recommendations about resources that our audience ought to check out. So Mohammed, we'll start with you and then Dor, uh, what resources would you want to share? Yeah, I, I think uh, there, there's going to be a lot of people who will be highly varied, right? Some people have basically barely heard of AI. Others will be on the cutting edge. So how do you tailor to such a diverse audience of, of knowledge users? Fortunately, um, we have um, the uh, the largest AI medicine um, center of any university in the country called TCARM, the Temerty Center for Artificial Intelligence Research and Education Medicine, um, uh, through a very generous donation to, to, from the Temerty family, which really actually has a lot of activity in terms of education. We have an education hub where you can go in and it'll actually have resources for you from very basic AI principles to very, very sophisticated concepts. Um, we have a speaker series that happen every month. We have trainee rounds that bring together students in medicine, engineering, uh, computer science, statistics, all learning together. Every month, there's about 80 to 100 students. We have 24 universities and over 90 organizations across the country with over 1,200 members all learning from each other, which I think is very, very exciting. Um, and there's lots of, of room for other people to come and learn with us. So I'd encourage you to, to visit uh, TCARM. There's no cost. Um, we just really want everyone to learn, be educated, and to drive AI uh, to be part of our future. Yeah, and I, I'm a member of TCARM also. Uh, and and so we will make sure that we put the link uh, in, in our resource page. Um, and um, we'll also, uh, there's been a lot of terminology that's come up. So we'll also have some definitions, L- LLMs and, uh, you know, AGI and all of the kind of things. We'll put them, we'll put them all in. Uh, Dor, what are your resources? Sure. So thanks, Muhammad and his great organization will teach you everything you need to know about AI. Um, I'll recommend two other things. Um, one is in May of this year, the U.S. Surgeon General came out with an advisory really laying out the issues around loneliness and social isolation. It's US centric, but it's it's valid worldwide. It's 65 pages of facts and figures. And actually what he claims there is that loneliness and social isolation is now the number one cause of death in the United States. More than diabetes, dementia, uh, heart disease, um, drug abuse, smoking. So it's, I think, very, very interesting to read that and to understand that. Um, of course, it's not that loneliness kills you. It's that that state increases the chance of developing dementia by 200%, heart disease by over 100%, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I hope that as people understand this, they'll stop treating loneliness as a taboo topic or look down at it and really start putting programs in place to help treat it. Um, digital or physical or all of the above doesn't matter. And the second thing, as we are talking about AI, and I'm not going to do a better job than a university hospital to <laughs> help educate about that, I'd recommend a great book called Clara and the Sun, um, which really helps um, you kind of imagine what the world of humans living with AI and robots could be like. It's a little bit morbid, but I loved it. Uh, It's by uh, Kazuo Ishiguro, and it's a great read. Great. And um, I've read that book. It is a great read. And um, one other book that I I would recommend on the robot front is by Kate Darling called The New Breed, if you want, because you were talking before about the relationship people will have with robots. And that is a really, really interesting read. Roseanne, uh, you, I think, might have a, a resource or two for us as well. Yeah. My resource is going to build off Dor's resource because he mentioned um, the Surgeon General's report about loneliness and the impact of it. So I'm going to shamelessly plug Allison because I don't know that she's going to do it for herself. (laughs) She and Jay Ingram are actually co-hosting a new podcast. Don't abandon our podcast. Just add to the podcast. Um, 
a new podcast called Defy Dementia. And they are going to spend um, each month informing Canadians and people around the world about the modifiable risk factors of dementia with loneliness and social isolation being one of them. So wherever you check out your pods, smash the subscribe button for Defy Dementia or visit defydementia.org. Allison, shameless, but I, I went there. Appreciate it. And it's shameless. She, I should mention Roseanne is our executive dire- uh, producer for that podcast. So she's plugging herself too. And we can't do, we couldn't do it without her. Um, the one, one other uh, shameless plug for Cabby that I would make, because it came up before the importance of engaging with end users uh, is, is our leap platform. So if, if you are an innovator and you want to figure out, you know, how might someone uh, interact with your solution or what solutions would people really be wanting to use, check out our LEAP platform if you're an older adult or a caregiver or someone in uh, the um, care system. Check it out because you might want to join and you can really, you can be be at the really at the center of guiding the innovation from the very beginning. And that's going to make all of the innovations much, much more successful in the long run. So thank you, Mohammed and Dor, for joining us on this podcast. It's been amazing to chat with you both. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. We also want to thank our podcast production team, including Monique Chang, Lisa Hartford, Rebecca Hilchik, and our friends over at Podtex. To learn more about Cabby, please visit us at cabby.com. That's C-A-B-H-I dot com. And if you want to support Cabby, you can donate at baycrest.org slash donate to Cabby. That's B-A-Y-C-R-E-S-T dot org slash D-O-N-A-T-E-T-O-C-A-B-H-I. We'll be sure to add the address in our episode show notes and all the other resources that our guests mentioned.